Welcome back to DBD TV, the red-headed stepchild of the Dragon Ball Dissection family, where we take an uncomfortably long look at material exclusive to the television adaptation of the Dragon Ball franchise. In regards to the ending of my last video, well, I went a little off the deep end. Don't get me wrong, I actually like the Mount Paozu house better than the manga house, but that still doesn't make that house or the name Mount Paozu part of the manga continuity, and I feel compelled to stamp out that notion whenever I can because it's pretty pervasive. I should have left it there though, but instead I also claimed the term was never used again after that. But it does rear its ugly head in dialogue in the 10th Z movie, which, you know, doesn't really count to begin with. The 10th anniversary Dragon Ball movie, which, hey, is its own standalone continuity, and... Uh... Dragon Ball GT, which technically is part of the anime continuity, or at least an anime continuity. Do you think I can get a pass if Dragon Ball Super totally overwrites it? As far as I've been able to confirm, it's never used in the Dragon Ball Z series again, but at this point I'm not willing to commit to anything because as soon as I say it, someone will find another example I missed. So I'll just leave it at the important points that the show gave Goku a different house, backpedaled to match the manga design, and gave the mountainous area where he grew up a name, which does not exist in the original manga. Moving on! Last time we left off, Gohan had many more adventures in the wilderness than his manga counterpart, but Gohan isn't the only character to get attention with this filler. Goku has stuff to do! The Serpentine Road isn't just a pointless time sink, but a treacherous journey! The Chekhov's gun set up in the manga actually gets a payoff when Goku takes a nap on a street sweeper's truck, and the fact that the Serpentine Road has a street sweeper is just beautiful in and of itself. Only to fall off and land in hell and have to compete against the two ogres who work there in order to find a secret passage back to Enma's desk. It's a hell of a lot of fun! A hell of a lot of fun. A hell of a lot of fun. <clears throat> Later on, he comes across the palace of the Snake Princess, who does her best to seduce Goku with, of course, Goku oblivious to the whole thing, until he ultimately has to fight her to get away. Neither of these really ties into the main story, but I like them. And, oh, that man candy. When Goku does reach Kaios, his training goes a little differently. In the manga, it takes him 40 days to catch bubbles. However, in the anime, it only takes him three weeks, with the remaining time used to train against a new character, Gregory the Cricket, who doesn't care for Goku's lack of respect towards Kaiosama. But he was actually designed by Toriyama for the anime staff. And that's not all. While taking a break, Goku convinces Kaio to tell him the backstory of the Saiyans, which comes from a memo Toriyama wrote. There had originally been two races on the planet, the Saiyans and the Sufurujin, or Sufurians, the latter of whom were physically weak but technologically advanced. Eventually a war broke out because, <laughs> get it, vegetables versus fruits? The Saiyans won and teamed up with aliens to serve as muscle to conquer planets until the god of the Saiyan planet, unable to tolerate evil, summoned meteors to destroy them all. That last little bit doesn't appear to be part of Toriyama's memo, and so it should come as no surprise that it's completely contradicted later on by the manga's assertion that it was Frieza, and Kaio's status as an upper god makes it unlikely that he was simply unaware of the real story. Everyone talks about that one though, but perhaps you didn't notice this little tangle. During his story, Kaio, in no uncertain terms, says that Saiyans transform into monsters at the full moon. And Goku does not react to this at all. At all. As for the Sufurians, I'm sure they'll never come up again. But aside from Goku and Gohan, even the rest of the characters get a few moments. First, to elaborate on my aspersions cast against the first episode, I like the idea of us spending time with Gohan before his life turns upside down, rather than just throwing him into the story, even though it pulls the audience away from the Kame House gang's perspective at meeting him for the first time and experiencing the same shock they do. I just think with how much of it there is and how slowly it's paced, it doesn't really work as a first episode for a new series, which is what they were apparently going for by... making it a new series. It works much better as an episode 154. But I do think they did a great job of reintroducing the rest of the cast who hadn't been present for the Kame House reunion. We actually see Kurudin and Bloom attract down and round up the rest, which is a lot of fun. 
but it also means the anime cuts out the scene where they locate and give out battle power numbers for them. Instead, the anime replaces it with a moment of checking the sea turtle's battle power. Oh. So they find Yamcha working as a professional baseball player, which is a Toriyama suggestion, and one of the coolest things ever. I mean, it's flipping brilliant. He's a martial artist with ridiculously superhuman levels of strength, but he needs money to survive. So, yeah, naturally he'd be a home run king. He even takes his Roga Fufu Ken stance at bat. It just seems like such a no-brainer to put those skills to good use. I wish more of the characters did stuff like this. However, Yamcha isn't terribly happy with the whole thing and wants to get back to martial arts. He even jumps at the chance to join a brawl on the field, which is equally hilarious. But I do like how, when he feels Kurujin's hand on his shoulder, he immediately recognizes this is someone who can take care of himself. The whole thing just feels cool and classic, the bored veteran dying for an opportunity to come out of retirement. Sadly, I don't feel the others quite measure up to the awesomeness of Yamcha playing baseball. It's nice to see Ten Shinhan, Chaozu, and Lunch sharing a house together, but it's all what you'd expect. Lunch is robbing things, Ten Shinhan and Chaozu are training. We don't really get anything new from them. It doesn't even feel like Ten Shinhan even wants Lunch there, so it's not as if some big character developments happened over the past five years. We do get to see bits of their training with God and Popo, and in sparring, Yajirobe bites Kuririn on the butt. He did this in the last arc, too. Were they trying to make this into a running joke? That Yajirobe likes eating ass? Well, like the aborted running gag of Yamcha and company getting lost, it doesn't continue past its second appearance. But the main bit of filler concerning these guys is the episode with the Pendulum Room, which is freaking awesome! First of all, it looks a lot spookier than the time room Goku went into to meet Mutaito. But they travel back to a past in their minds to fight a pair of surly scions, and it doesn't end well, but humbles them quite a bit. It's very dark and tense, and I like how they're picked off one by one. Chaozu is taken out before the fighting even begins in earnest because... nobody cares about Chaozu. Then Kuridin is taken out. And it comes down to Yamcha and Ten Shinhan, who were killed in fairly gruesome ways, despite using their best attacks. I like how it totally mixes up the order from how they'll be taken out in the real battle. And it makes sense that Yajirobe wouldn't even bother to participate. The only real dud of this bunch, I'd say, is an episode during Piccolo's and Gohan's training, where it turns out that Goku's old space pod just happens to be in the vicinity of their training, is still powered up, and is emitting some kind of message that first turns Gohan rabid and regrows his tail, and then emits a projection of the moon that turns him into a great ape. This is stupid on so many levels. I mean, it's not Yamcha and Tambourine stupid, but it's still pretty stupid. First is the contrivance that they just happened to be within spitting distance of where Goku landed, and was found by the elder Gohan, especially considering that the anime changes the training location to an island, and Goku's adult home to where he lived as a kid. The idea that it's been working all this time is ludicrous. How a full moon projection ties in with Vegeta's explanation of Brute's waves? Well, it doesn't. And the fact that Piccolo blows the thing up ends up creating a huge plot hole since it's a space pod that's the foundation for the ship Goku uses to get the Namek. The only good thing about this is that apparently Piccolo knows the Bankoku Bikuri show as he uses it against Gohan in what you could consider either an homage or ripoff of the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai arc. And yes, I mentioned Lunch earlier. It should come as no surprise that the anime included her, as they would have no reason to know that she wouldn't be coming back, especially considering Toriyama's promotional art and chapter title pages still included her. But it does look rather silly in retrospect that she keeps showing up in filler in this arc, when she doesn't show up in the manga story at all. I already mentioned her introduction, but afterwards, she follows Ten Shinon to Karting Tower and tries to rob Upa and Bora. Upa's an interesting case since he's fairly grown up now, and he's one of the few instances in the anime where he's actually recast as a young man rather than keeping his original performer. Finally, during the fight with Vegeta, we see Lunch getting drunk in a bar, aware that Ten Shinon is dead due to the fight being filmed by a camera crew in the anime, and is very depressed. That's... Kind of a sad note to leave her on, but that's the last time she's seen for quite a while. I mean, in the anime's continuity, does she ever know for sure that Ten Shinon comes back to life? Although, would she have any reason to think he wouldn't come back? Honestly, I do wonder if they realized something was up by the time the fighting started, because why wouldn't they have just put her with the rest of the gang at Kame House? See, while Yajirobe in the manga doesn't get involved in the battle until partway through Goku's fight with Vegeta, 
In the anime, he actually shows up to the landing site just after the city is destroyed and uses his key sensing abilities to send reporters in the direction of the battle, in return for a bunch of money. So, in their attempts to get the scoop, they show up in their best helicopters and USS Enterprise shuttlecraft, which I covered in detail in one of my first Dragon Ball-related videos. While most of them get blown up immediately for their troubles, some of them stay far enough away to get television coverage of the early parts of the fight, which the non-fighter characters watch from Kame House. Nappa kills the rest of the reporters during the three-hour break, which makes that part of the story a little less pointless than it was in the manga. After a big gap without any coverage, Udenai Baba arrives and shows the rest on her crystal ball, so it gives the other characters a chance to react to the carnage, and it's often quite effective. It's heartbreaking seeing Pu'ar suffer a complete collapse after Yamcha's death, although it is a bit annoying and all too typical that they keep him unconscious for the entire rest of the arc. I mean, Chi-Chi passes out too, but they still give her stuff to do later on. Funnily enough, Toriyama would reuse the same device years later with the Cell arc, although I actually feel it's done much better here. So, I technically include this as part of the Frieza arc, but we might as well talk about it now since I'm already on the subject. Since Bluma and the others already know a lot of the details about the fight in this version, it causes dialogue in the aftermath to have to be changed. In the original, Bluma assumes one of the four survivors is Piccolo, which would mean that the dead can still be brought back to life. When she finds out it's actually Yajirobe, she breaks down and cries, leading Yajirobe to wonder if they wish he died instead. However, in the anime, since she already saw segments of the fight after Piccolo's death, she couldn't be surprised by that reveal. So instead, she manages to keep her cool until Yajirobe shows up, at which point she chews him out for being cowardly and useless, saying that he should have died instead of Piccolo. And at this point, she breaks down sobbing. They both work in different ways, and I have to credit the anime for taking Yajirobe's line from the manga and actually giving it some serious dramatic weight. I mean, telling a guy he should have died instead of somebody else? That's pretty dark. And I can't think of a happier note to end on. I feel like I could go on in even greater detail, but you get the point. As much as I gush about it, it's not perfect. There are a few things I consider mistakes or missteps. The anime falls back on that annoying Dragon Ball crutch by randomly giving Vegeta telepathy for no reason. There's a bit where Gohan mistakenly calls him a Senko a Kamehameha, and even in an arc that has well-integrated filler, it still sometimes overreaches what the manga is going to allow it to do. I mean, as awesome as the Pendulum Room stuff is, the point was supposed to be to humble the characters in the face of Sai and Strength, and yet they all still show up completely lighthearted and overconfident and... yeah. But these are relative nitpicks compared to how good it is overall. The anime Saiyan arc lends the proceedings a strong three-act type structure, with Goku struggles against Raditz setting the stage in the first act, followed by a large second act of minor adventures advancing character development, and concluding with the big fight that everything has been leading up to for so long. Everything just feels sharper here. It doesn't feel like a lot of filler later on, which is just boring and plays it way too safe. And it might be my imagination, but even the art and animation seem better in the Saiyan and early Freeze arcs, as if the new series launch somehow bumped the quality. I mean, sure, you have Studio Live making a mess of things once every several weeks, and believe you me when I say it took them forever to figure out how to draw a decent Vegeta. But overall, I'd say this is probably the best the anime looks. Even the coloring helps add to the sense of progression in the final fight. The manga shows it's just before noon when the Saiyans land and it's nightfall when they pick up the bodies. One of the things I've liked about this fight is how draining it feels, like it's been a really long, traumatizing day for the characters. A sense of time does wonders for that. I give Toriyama full credit for the idea, but the anime picks up on that and carries it to fullest flower. So it's daytime and blue skies at the beginning. After the three hour break, everything is pinker to illustrate the sun getting lower in the sky. And by the time Goku and Vegeta are fighting, there's a greenish tint to what's left of the blue sky, indicating the arrival of dusk. Sadly, this is also when the first of our main six animation teams bows out, as freelancer Aoshima Katsumi, one of my favorite animation supervisors, supervises his last episodes in the Saiyan arc. He'd still stick around to work on the movies, and hey, that's a great consolation, right? Goku vs. Frieza might look like crap, but at least we got him to animate Slug. But on the bright side, he went out on a good one, episode 30. That's the one where Goku and Vegeta begin fighting, and that's an episode I always see people pointing to as an absolutely gorgeous specimen. And I agree. 
So when all is said and done, if I was scoring the anime arc separately from the manga, I might be persuaded to say the Saiyan arc would get the top score. <gasps> so I hope you're enjoying Dragon Ball Dissection December so far. When we come back next week, it's what you've all been waiting for. The Cell arc finally begins. See you there. Oh, just don't tell the power scalers how easily Vegeta blows up a planet in filler. Riots will begin over this, I swear. Oh, we're talking